Star-studded night for the premiere of 20th Century Fox's $25 million motion picture, Hello, Dolly. The Klieg lights were bright at Grauman's Chinese Theater, signaling the kind of synthetic hoopla that has traditionally launched many a Hollywood extravaganza. There were fans and autograph hounds, even a fleet of antique studio Rolls Royces for names that have lost their relevance for most of today's movie audience. The truth is that a movie star no longer assures the financial success of a picture. 1967 and 68, you know, uh, which is where the industry bent. Uh, what happened was is that there were big money productions. And they started to almost taking the studios down with them. There was a period there where Paramount was going to go under, or 20th was selling off part of its lot. And there uh, was general panic in the industry. The king had died. There wasn't anybody at home in the studios. There wasn't any Louis B. Mayer or Zanuck. This was just coming off to of the end of the period when actors were contracted to studios and directors and writers. When that all broke up in the mid to late 60s, uh, people started taking those studios over and they would turn to the filmmakers. Young directors knew something that they didn't know, which was maybe what the audiences were looking for. And so there was this climate which made it possible for me to make a lot of movies which I know I couldn't get made now. What are you doing, Alice? I'm getting undressed. Alice. Relax. Oh, relax. Stop it, Alice. <laughs> Screw me. I am being honest. I am doing what I feel like doing. Well, what do you feel like doing? I feel like doing what we came up here to do. And what is that? Orgy. Have an orgy. 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 There was a different audience, wasn't there? there? There was a new audience. There was an audience that the studios didn't even know existed. Socket 2. It was an audience that had been politicized by Vietnam and Watergate, whose consciousness had been changed with drugs. I think that's very important. And it was an open audience. Every single standard or consensus, if you will, by which we'd lived our lives up to the 60s got questioned. Everyone. What was authority, what was virtue, what was heroism, what was sexuality, what was male, what was female. And it was fueled partly by the music being created in the late 60s, the hippie movement. It was the blossoming of the counterculture movement that had started with Kerouac and, and the Beats. Now picked up through the descent over Vietnam, the, the honest difference of opinion and uh, questioning of, of our government's uh, motives to the civil rights movement, questioning this injustice. Then a woman's movement grew out of the political movements, and so suddenly girls who were helping the guys in protesting in Berkeley were saying, wait, why do I have to get the coffee all the time? What if, you know, let's carry it the next step. The 70s was the first time we could celebrate the freedoms won from the 50s and 60s with our art. 
where whites could go see James Brown and Tina Turner and not be called a nigger lover. Jimi Hendrix could play white rock and roll and not be called an Uncle Tom. The people that go to the movies were looking for something that was more meaningful to them than the glitz of the 60s films. It wanted to deal with difficult films and see difficult films and different films, and it didn't want the same old stuff like nowadays, where the same old stuff is, is just repeated and repeated. And it wanted to be challenged, and it, um, it wanted to be surprised. Does your personal religion or philosophy include a life after death? Oh, yes, indeed. That's absolutely... Did you enjoy life when you were a child? Oh, yes, you were a wonderful baby, Harold. Do you think the sexual revolution has gone too far? It certainly has. Do you find the idea of wife swapping distasteful? I even find the question distasteful. Do you enjoy... Harold, please. Hollywood films hadn't changed for a long, long time. You measured in many ways your pleasure at movies from the distance they lived from your own life. You know, you could watch Ingrid Bergman walking up a fog and shroud and ramp to a plane and Bogart waving goodbye. You knew this was never going to happen to you, ever. That started to change again with these revolutions that happened in the 60s. People wanted something that they recognized that was part of them. That it wasn't the distance from your life that was the appealing thing. In many ways, it was the recognition that that was a part of your life. Ben, what are you doing? Well, I would say that I'm just drifting here in the pool. Why? Well, it's very comfortable just to drift here. Have you thought about graduate school? No. Would you mind telling me then what those four years of college were for? What was the point of all that hard work? You got me. If you're coming out of the drug re revolution and the sex revolution and the civil rights revolution, you've got a lot of attitude out you know? <laughs> and, 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 and you've been taking on uh, the military industrial complex, you've been taking on uh, all kinds of religious structures, you know, you've been involved in protests. And so, you, you have those tools, uh, that arrogance and that uh, uh, self, um, how do you say it, the uh, well, self-confidence, uh, uh, just to say, I know what we should be doing. I know what we should do, be doing about Vietnam, I know what we should be doing about where it's right, and I know what we should be doing about motion pictures. Of course we thought that movies could make the world better and could illuminate contemporary life and be, that artists didn't have to just be employees, that artists could be, uh, you know, stand with the other leaders of society and contribute. No one's saying anything. Let's say something. Let's, let's make stories about what is. There's so much going on. What are we feeling? I, that's what I was going through, you know? I was, uh, I was uh, feeling uh, artistic. <laughs> Film business was, you know, a decadent, decaying, emptied whorehouse, and it had to be assaulted. You know, and so you had that student film mentality that, uh, you know, let's pick up the banner of Godard and walk in there and take it over. European films of the 60s. Those were the most powerful influences on, on American filmmakers at that time. French New Wave, the Italian New Wave, uh, films from Japan, 
which were extraordinary films from Russia, was still extraordinary. I was certainly influenced by Bergman and Fellini. The Fellinis and the Godards and the, and the De Sicas. Rossellini and De Sica. Rossellini first, and then Fellini, Visconti. Truffaut and uh, Romer. Sada Giant Ray. Or René, let's say, or Godard. The major influence on me was Antonioni. Bertolucci was a, a big big influence on me. My favorite was Buñuel, actually. There's Renoir, and then there's everybody else. I loved Bergman. I loved Kurosawa. And then also Kurosawa. Kurosawa? Kurosawa, and the Ozu, and some of the other Japanese directors. The filmmakers that influenced me the most, I don't know their names, because I would go see a film, and I hate it, and I'd say, I gotta remember never to do anything like that again. In the 60s and 70s, every major college campus and the area around on Friday nights was full of kids going to foreign films. La Dolce Vita, which was big, 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 big news for the California film campuses. Everyone was talking about La, La Dolce Vita and Roman Polanski, who was a film student in Poland, had made Night in the Water, greatly admired. Using handheld the way they were using grainy black and white, the way they were expressing things, the little stories, the human events, they were all very moving to me. We were tremendously conscious that these people like Fellini and Godard and Antonioni and others were working in a different way of storytelling that we were. Breaking out of the seamless, the seamless style of the classical cinema of Hollywood, which we all loved, but um, was a part of, seemed, seemed to be a part of another world, in a way. And this world was new and open, and anything was possible. One thing that Godard said, which really affected me, he said, you know, you can, uh, the way you can beat the studio system is by locking them inside their studios and going out and shooting in the street, because uh, the whole world's a soundstage, and they're pretending it's all inside their building. Truffaut's fluid camera was an extraordinary experience and the handheld sort of quality, the rough, the rough quality. I mean, I realized that you could do almost anything if your heart and your spirit was in the right place for the movie that you were making. <laughs> These were new forms. This was a new way of storytelling. The uh, concepts and the execution were highly original. Now, they may have had their roots in American filmmaking of another period, but it was not disguised so much as transformed. I was influenced by the European filmmakers' affection for American films. Their point was that, that in the studio system, despite the mm, factory-like nature of the business, there were those filmmakers whose personality transcended all events and whose personality you could feel in the work no matter who wrote it, no matter who produced it, or in fact, no matter who was in it. You know, Hawks' movies are, are very personal to him and reflected very much his particular code of behavior, his code of honor, his, his philosophy of life, his attitude toward men and women. And yet, it was always done within the framework of a, of a story and a movie that you, know, that you didn't have to be initiated into to follow. When the French decided to discover us, in my view, they discovered our crap. They didn't discover our great movies. I've never read a serious Cahiers de Cinema piece on Willie Wilder or Billy Wilder. Each of them had the highest level of work of almost any director I can think of. The sheer quality, one after another, after another, after another. The work of American directors over the years has been absolute. It's movies. Everything is linked in these discussions, so you then have to go back to the golden age of television, which had happened in the late 40s, early 50s, out of which John Frankenheimer and Lumet and Arthur Penn. And so the generation of the 70s, as always, was standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, John Frankenheimer was a giant. I mean, his work that he did as a 26-year-old live television, which was a more cinema-style live television, that was amazing work that will stand forever as great cinema. And it was done live. It was one day, one shot. You know, figure it out. How did they do it, even? Arthur Penn was a, a theater director. He was very admired. And, I mean, for myself, as a theater student, 
really looked up to Arthur Penn and, and uh, was very impressed with even the earlier films he had made. When I had first read the Benton and Newman script, they had been influenced by seeing Jules and Jim, by French cinema, who in turn had been influenced by its love of old American gangster movies, and the two reached a sort of confluence with Bonnie and Clyde. Suddenly, it was possible to conceive of sexual scenes and uh, suggestions of sexual behavior that had never, never been permitted before. It's hard to understand, if you hadn't lived before that time, what a major impact that freedom of a point of view did to people's brains. You say, wait, wait a minute, then, there's no, then there are no rules here. Wait a minute! Independent film, when I started, was typified by the films of someone like John Cassavetes, who went out with his acting buddies and his wife, and they all took no salaries and made John Cassavetes movies. Faces, John Cassavetes' Faces, was a tremendous art house hit got nominations and everything and it was a big surprise for everybody because it was a grainy 16 millimeter movie blown up and it was that was a very personal movie and I think that was the beginning of what a lot of people uh, interpreted as the new Hollywood. Cassavetes was a great influence and uh, also made when I saw Shadows that's when I realized you can maybe actually go off and do a film meaning that you don't have to have the trappings of the studio. Cassavetes is wonderful to watch. I never worked for him, but I saw him shoot a few times. And he would give anybody the camera. You know, if you, uh, well, you don't like the shot, well, you shoot it. Suddenly it'd be a guy who never had a camera in his hand before. And he liked that. He liked the, he liked the freshness of it. As far as a technical director, I'm a very difficult director. Because I have no truck with anyone that doesn't watch the scene. Uh, I have no regard for anyone that isn't with it and it isn't trying to make it the best that they can. Now, as far as their eye is concerned, I want them to be as creative with their own eye, not with my eye. Cassavetes was after photographing inner emotions. That was his quest. It was not at that time the quest of mainstream filmmakers. He was doing absolutely everything that he'd been doing forever and that everyone else suddenly started to do. And in the 70s, he made his wonderful film, A Woman Under the Influence. Hey, what time is it, please? Because I'm waiting till I get to school, and I don't know what time the school is. Hey, you. Hey, you've got a watch on. Will you tell me the time? I'll go get the little chains on your shoes. Big bear? Jeez, the week. Wait, hear the time, please, because I'm waiting. Hey, listen, you birds, I'm waiting for my kids at school. Do you mind giving me the time? Do you? What's the matter with you? What the? Huh? Do you have your time? There was a tremendous, just like the rays of the sun in a magnifying glass, it was starting to focus on this group of younger people, fueled partly by people like Roger Corman and AIP, who, for their own profit motives, would say, hey, go make a movie, I'll give you $20,000, you go and make it and give you a chance. And, and certainly I became Roger's assistant quite early, and so I started to pick up some real low-budget production savvy, which is like, how do you make a movie when you hardly have any money? AIP, American International Pictures, to us, was the greatest independent studio that was ever, and Roger came from them. The Roger Corman Guerrilla University of filmmaking, you know. Don't get permission, they won't give you permission, just shoot it. A lot of people that he really said, you know what, you have vision, you know, and tenacity, and you're willing to sleep on the floor and share a burger for a week, you know, and cut film and learn it. I, it was very important to me because up to that point, before making Box Cut Bertha, I just made movies when we had the camera. You know, there was no schedule. Have, you, had, you guys have lights. There was no fast film, there were no, no fast lenses, and we had no lights. We did the movies for $275,000 in 10 days. 
and we shot two of them back to back. We shot 10 days, took a week off, and shot another one. We broke every rule there was. No permits, we just went in the street and shot, and then when the police were coming, we'd leave. I remember Roger said, your stuff doesn't cut. So what do you mean doesn't cut? Well, I just seen the cut, it doesn't work. Roger, there's no way it doesn't cut. He's, he's, well, look at it, you'll see. So I looked at it, I said, well, it's not cut right. He's one to cut it yourself. I said, well, I don't know how to use the editing machine. Oh, don't you know how to use the editing machine? Dennis can show you. Dennis, show Peter how to use. So, you know, he showed me how to use a moviola. It took him 15 minutes. And Jack and I always used to look at each other and say, what does he see? I mean, I'm not interesting, and you're the most boring fuck I've ever seen. All we do is talk about ourselves and how much better we are than everybody else. Or we can do that. He says, Derns, we can do that. We can do whatever we want to do. We can take over the town. I said, Jack, you can't get a, a role on episodic TV. And Harry Dean and I just to get to carry, you know, Lee Major's luggage on Big Valley. When I got the job, I was concerned that, look, Roger, I've never acted before. I'm a student. Oh, don't worry about it. You know, we'll get you a coach, you know. And there were these great coaches in Los Angeles. Um, and I started, they gave me the actor studio. Uh, the actor's workshop, the myth that they gave me all these great books on Stanislavski, right? So I'm learning this profound work, and I'm going to do a Roger Corman, <laughs> you, know, you know, Booties in the Jungle movie. So I said, I'm going to do it. Well, I don't care if it's a B movie. I'm going in and I'm going to kill you. <laughs> he came to us and said, I have another picture called The Terror, and I have two free days left over with Boris Karloff. So what I want you to do is look at the terror, figure out a way to shoot two days with Boris Karloff and make a different picture out of it so I can re-release it and make money. I started saying to Peter, why aren't those Boris Karloff pictures scary, frightening? I decided that what was modern horror was someone shooting at you for no reason. Polly and I talked about it. It was actually based on an idea that... Um Harold Hayes, my editor at Esquire, suggested that there might be a movie in the story of Charles Whitman, a young man who'd gone to the top of the tower in Texas and wounded a bunch of people, killed a few, and then killed himself. We juxtaposed this ancient movie star and this white-bred American boy who, for no reason whatsoever, he starts shooting people. I was totally convinced that they were all talented, and I was positive they would all be successful. I had no way of knowing that they would be so insanely successful. If you wanna be a bird. Easy Rider was such a strange, uh, strange beginning because we went in to pitch this to Bob Rafelson and Bert Schneider, who were friends, you know. And Peter couldn't, couldn't stop talking about Easy Rider, which at that time was called The Loners. And he said, uh, you know, we're going to make this movie, uh, The Loners, and uh, AIP is going to give us the money, but we're having a little problem now because they promised us that, that Dennis could direct and act in the picture, but now they're just going to, they say he's got to make a choice, either can direct or act, but he can't do both. So out of that, they gave us the money. They gave us $340,000 to make the movie. But first they gave me just, uh, I think it was 12000 to go and shoot in New Orleans, Mardi Gras, in 16 millimeter. And if that went well, then they would give us the rest of the money. Well, it was a disaster in New Orleans. And I got a bunch of friends who had 16 millimeter cameras and who all wanted to be directors, five friends of mine, to go with me down to New Orleans to shoot. And I said, the one thing you must not do, you must never shoot any film unless I tell you to. Well, every time I turned around, they were shooting another thing, you know. And I was screaming, yelling, fighting at the end of it. Bill Hayward, my brother-in-law at that time, and Peter Fonda, who had grown up together, who were partners, started recording me, and they took these tapes back to Schneider, saying, we'll give you the money back, we really want to apologize, Hopper's obviously lost it, listen to these tapes. And here I am saying, I am! 
ask for a yellow light and a red light and a green light. That's all I ask for in the cemetery. Where the fuck are they? You blah, blah, blah. You know, and this maniac screaming, I'm going to win the con film, blah, blah, blah. Crazy out of my mind. And who's over there? And starting fights in the middle of the street. And they're recording me. Nobody's doing anything, just recording me. So Schneider says, well, you know, he really sounds excited, but did he ask for those lights? And why weren't the lights there? You know, I hired him to direct this movie. I'm not replacing him. The public, though, I think, went for the picture because they felt we were up to something real. Uh, beyond, yeah, we're really smoking dope. <laughs> yeah, it's really this. And yeah, we're really riding the motorcycles and we're not on a trailer and a traveling car and so forth. Uh, all that reality, too. But there was something more real. Our own mistakes, which were real. Easy Rider started to be something where we were going to say, my God, see what society is doing to the outcast, to the outlaw. We were assuming the, the great stance of the outlaw. Halfway through, we, we took a look at the outlaw and figured he blew it too. And <laughs> oh, we've done it, we've done it. We're rich, Wyatt. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we did it, man, we did it. We did it. <laughs> We're rich, man. We're retired in Florida now, mister. <clears throat> you know, Billy? We blew it. What? <laughs> what, what, what? That's what it's all about, man. I mean, like, you know. I mean, you go for the big money, man, and then you're free. You dig? <laughs> We blew it. Good night, man. I had done films with Peter Fonda, Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, and they were very successful and caused a minor revolution. But Easy Rider was a major revolution. <laughs> Easy Rider encapsulated the ideas of the youth movement, of the counterculture. The thing about Easy Rider was that it opened the door for a lot of young filmmakers. And the studios, when they made money on Easy Rider, saw that if they let go, these directors might make films that could actually tap that audience. Easy Rider suddenly was a big hit. Everybody said, wait a second, wait a second. Maybe these guys know something that we don't know. We'd already had this revolution in cinema in Britain in the 60s. And then it was much more, ours was much more to do with class. And I'm talking about Tony Richardson, Lindsay Anderson, Carol Rice, and John Schlesinger. I think it's curious about John Schlesinger that he then went on to make what I think is an archetypal American 70s film, which is Midnight Cowboy, which has all the ingredients of uh, North American 70s filmmaking. It's got sex, drugs, anti-authoritarianism and the great quest for freedom, which, which was a theme through many of the films, the quest for some mythical freedom, as well as being a brilliant critique of the sadness and injustice of a marginalized American society. John Schlesinger. He was a documentarian before he became a filmmaker with theatrical films, and that all had to do with the specifics, the taste of things, the, the real props, the real environment, and his eye was schooled to all those realities. And when we would walk in the streets and stuff like that, he would make notes, mental notes of what he saw. He encouraged improvisation as well, but not undisciplined uh, improvisation, improvisation toward the script. No rich lady with any class at all buys that cowboy crap anymore. They're laughing at you on the street. Ain't nobody laughing at me on the street. Turn your back, I seen them laughing at you, fella. Oh, what the hell do you know about women anyway? When's the last time you scored, boy? It's a matter I only talk about a confession. We're not talking about me now. Well, when's the last time you've been to confession? It's between me and my confessor. And I'll tell you another thing. Frankly, you're beginning to smell. And for a stud in New York, that's a handicap. Oh, well, don't talk to me about it, clean. I ain't never seen you change your underwear once the whole time I've been here in New York. And that's pretty peculiar behavior. I don't have to do that kind of thing in public. I ain't got no need to expose myself. No, I bet you don't. I bet you ain't never even been laid. How about that? And you're gonna tell me what appeals to women. I know enough to know that that great big dumb cowboy crap of yours don't appeal to nobody except every Jackie on 42nd Street. That's faggot stuff. 
You want to call it by its name? That's strictly for fags. I, John Wayne, you want to tell me he's a fag? Films that featured bad behavior, nudity, and bad language, films that were assaultive, were seen to be important and necessary to deal with the huge social confusion that was going on. In uh, May of 1970, the Hard Hats down on Wall Street uh, uh, had a battle with the uh, war protesters and beat them up. And the newspapers uh, coined the term Hard Hat. The picture Joe opened in July of that year, so it caught all of that headline material magically, as it were. These kids, they shit on you. They shit on your life. They shit on everything you believe in. They shit on everything. You hate them as much as I do. No. No. It's your ass now, Compton. 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 As opposed to Rocky, where everybody was standing up cheering, uh, there was uh, uh, silence. And, um, but that was the effect that we were, uh, we were going for. The whole concept of movies is to be liked and make money. And often movies are there saying, uh, we don't care if you like us, we don't like you. And they're still making money. You know, go, go, how, how do you figure that? Because of the unsettled times, these kind of movies sort of made sense of it. These were just nose-thumbing movies. They, they are there to thumb their nose at your values. Oh, be black, baby, be black. Why don't you live in America? Why can't you learn to be part of it, huh? I'm not black, that's why. Well, now you can find out what it's like to be black. I'd like to talk to you. You have the kind of face that looks like no, you're attempting busy. to be. No, you are busy. No, well, why are you so busy that you don't know want to know what it's like to be no, black in America? No, no, no. So well, busy. Look, you're very busy. Do you have black people in your neighborhood, sir? Excuse me, sir. Do you know what it's like to be black in America? What? To be black in America. Yes. You do? I do. Do you know what NAACP means? No, Elgar. What does it mean? It means niggers ain't always colored people. What does he mean by that? He called us niggers. Us? The law says I have to serve him and says I can't. I'll tell you what you better do, Mr. Citizen Bartender. You take your beers and ram them up your ass sideways. You dig it? Whoa there, sunshine. We're going so you can take your hand off that horse cock you got stashed under the bar. How do you know I don't have something with a little more bark to it? Ho, ho, ho. This redneck is talking about firearms. Well, I know that you ain't got nothing but wood under there, my man, because I happened to be in here one night when a certain sailor got it laid up the side of his fucking head. What do you think about that, redneck? Boss of loses license for sure if I serve that. Chair. I'm gonna kick your ass around the block for drill, man. You try it and I'll call the shore patrol. I am the motherfucking shore patrol, motherfucker. I am the motherfucking shore patrol. Now give this man a beer. I don't want a beer anymore. You're gonna have a fucking beer! Come on! David Beagleman and the guys at Columbia looked at that script and said, Bob, you know. This language, I mean, wouldn't 20 motherfuckers be much more dramatic than 40 motherfuckers? <laughs> I said, yeah, David, it would, but the, the fact of the matter is that uh, that's a, a, assuming that swearing is a substitute for action, uh, 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 in the sense that uh, it, it's the equivalent of action. The swearing in this movie is a substitute for action because it's an expression of their impotence. They're not going to do anything but swear. One of the main things films were trying, were trying to do was to, to reflect life as it was rather than as authorities wanted it to be. You still on there? Listen, I just heard Bobby's OD. It took a shot at jump. What do you mean? Oh. 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 Get him out of here. Oh, I want to get him out of here. Oh. He's dying. Get him on his feet. Oh, he's not going to die. Get him on his feet. <laughs> Jeez. 
panic was a dream because both Kitty and uh, Al had not done anything before. So we were able to stay together a month and a half before just hanging out. It's a relentless film, but I think it's necessary to do films like that. You know, I mean, because before that, what, what did we see about drugs? Uh, Man with the Golden Arm, which was a Hollywood version of it. I think my early films are people that are just on the outside, you know. They're just uh, marginal people. And I, I, I guess I'm, I'm in sympathy with that. All right, Popeye's here! One of the most talented of my age group, and that was Billy Friedkin, who had done some incredible documentaries, one of which actually got a condemned killer off. I thought, my God, that's the ultimate dream of cinema, to have positive effect on life, you know, you know, instead of just being relegated to be this little kind of canary in a cage, be an entertainment. I could see when Phil D'Antoni, the producer, brought me this idea, I could see that I could induce the documentary style into this story. I would talk to the lighting cameraman, Owen Roisman, uh, and give him a general area of where the action was going to take place. I would talk separately to the operating cameraman, who was a guy named Ricky Bravo, who was a Cuban exile who uh, actually photographed the Cuban Revolution at Castro's side. And so I'd set up a scene with the actors, but I wouldn't show him. And I would then put Ricky in the room with a camera, and it was up to him to find the action. I'd say, a guy's going to be running down the street over there. And Ricky would say uh, in his broken English, okay, I, I use a wheelchair? Yeah, we'll put him in a wheelchair and wheel him along. We never laid dolly tracks down. A lot of the stuff in the chase uh, was an accident, was never planned. There wasn't supposed to be any crashes in that chase. They were all supposed to be near misses. There was no optical effects or anything. It was all done the way you saw it, and the camera captured it as best it could on the run. I went to see it on 86th Street, which is sort of like the middle ground between black New York and white New York. And when Gene Hackman and I come out of the police station and I'm pissing and moaning about my wounded hand, and he says, you dumb guinea. How the hell did I know he had a knife? Never trust a nigger. The audience applauded, which is mostly a black audience. They applauded. And I thought, oh, my goodness. This is what they knew Whitey was thinking anyway, and now somebody has finally said it in a movie. It would have been very difficult to put over, even get made, a lot of the films of the 70s if it wasn't for a prevalent attitude in the country that was receptive to this cynicism, irony. Bogdanovich's work, The Last Picture Show, was a new way of seeing, based very much on older forms, because Peter was highly influenced by the earlier Hollywood, but he managed to make his films with a more contemporary sensibility. It's been said that The Last Picture Show has a European feeling to it. But I don't think that was because of the filmmakers so much as it was the fact that I was a stranger to Texas. But to me, it was like a foreign country. I took pictures of the town in color, and they didn't look at all like the town that we had discovered, which we found it at magic hour. And the wind was blowing, and there was dust, and, and it was dark and gloomy. The day I took the pictures, it was a beautiful, sunny day with blue sky. And I started saying to Peter, and the buildings were all red brick, and I started saying to Peter, blue and red, you know, maybe I could paint the whole town gray. You know, I had all these odd ideas of what to do. And Orson Welles, who was our friend, said, of course you'll make it in black and white. <laughs> and and uh, Larry McMurtry, who wrote the book, said, Black and white is the only way to do it. And so we had all these brilliant people to whom we listened. Hey, look, new victims. Hi, JC. Hi. Glad you can make it. We're dressed informally, as you can see. Hi, JC. You know Annie Annie. You want to join the club? Sure. When I see it now, I'm kind of surprised when I see it because we were pretty candid about the sex. 
But I thought that that was sort of it. I mean, if we were going to make that picture, that book, I didn't see how we could make it and, and, and go around the corner with the sex because it was about teenage sex, which is fairly, you know, clumsy and awkward and funny, I thought. And because Bert Schneider and Bob Rafelson and Steve Blauner, that company, were, had made Easy Rider and made Five Easy Pieces, I was encouraged to go with the sex, to go with the stuff that a studio normally would have asked you to soft pedal. I just hate you. I don't know why I ever went with you. I don't know what happened. Well, put your clothes on. You think I want to sit around here and look at you naked? And I know you couldn't do it. Now I'll never get to not be a virgin. Why don't we tell everybody? The whole class knows. I just want to cry. I think you're the meanest boy I ever saw. My mother was dead right about you. It is more of that moment in American film when sort of you could get away with things. Suddenly you could do things that maybe you couldn't have done five years earlier at all. The independent movement had grown and encroached upon the majors' territory. The majors not being dummies. As a matter of fact, as you know, the executives at the majors generally are pretty smart. So they took a uh, variation on the old formula, if you can't beat them, join them, and they decided if they couldn't beat them, buy them out. So there was a hole there that existed, uh, a kind of time-space continuum warp hole that opened up for about three, four years. And a lot of people went into that and got their feet into the industry that way. the sort of the master pitchman who explains to me how you go in there and you just have all this confidence and you just tell them, I know what the audience wants. The idea was, this is the luckiest day of your life because I have come into your, your office and I am going to save your ass because I'm going to tell you how to make some money. Um, and, uh, and you can sort of pull it off. Also, it helps being young. Uh, when you get a track record of, 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 of flops and less than less than hits, you can't really walk in and say, I'm going to make you a lot of money. But if you haven't had a bunch of a track record, you say, you know, all I care about is money. And we're going to make some money together. And I talked my way into making The Rain People. It was only a $700,000 movie. Or I talked my way into doing You're a Big Boy Now. They were never pro any of those movies. But you were just able to, you know, wheel and deal. And we got some of them going. And then some of them were very successful. MASH was a studio film. It was such a cheap picture, and Fox, they didn't much care about it. It was a drive-in film. It was a B picture. They had two other wars going on there, Tora, 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 and Patton at the same time. So this didn't mean anything to them. I said, all we have to do is stay hidden, not go get over budget, don't do anything to draw attention to ourselves, and just keep our mouths shut and make our, make our picture. And I thought, you know, I can do all of the things that I wanted to do. Big ensemble cast, lots of people. Get away from this star leading man, leading lady kind of a situation and uh, deal with it in a more realistic and kind of a sloppy way. What are you two hoodlums doing in this hospital? Ma'am, we are surgeons and we are here to operate. We're just waiting for a starting time, that's well, you all. You can't even go near a patient until Colonel Merrill says it's okay, and he's still out to lunch. Look, Mother, I want to go to work in one hour. We are the pros from Dover, and we figure to crack this kid's chest and get out to the golf course before it gets dark. So you go find the gas passer, and you have him premedicate this patient. Then bring me the latest pictures on him. The ones we saw must be 48 hours old by now. Then call the kitchen and have them rustle us up some lunch. Ham and eggs will be all right. Steak would be even better. And then give me at least one nurse who knows how to work in close without getting her tits in my way. Oh, oh you fool. How do you want your steak cooked? I was blown away when I saw MASH. I thought, wow, uh, 
who had the brains to think it was funny with all I mean, who, who wasn't afraid how are these guys not afraid you know because up to that time everybody would have but that was something sacred about that this was a war the united states was a war this was you didn't poke fun at this stuff wonderful 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 film and what a relief to see a war film i never liked war films but uh, suddenly there was this war film where the soldiers were real people. It was funny, it was naughty, it was wicked. It was deeply irreverent about war, as opposed to the films previously, and opposed, uh, again, opposed to films made now, which all have a sort of reverence about war. By breaking the rules, he set a template for so many different things that came afterwards, like the subversion of genre, which was his big thing, wasn't it? And I mean, when, when before McCabe... Could, oh, could you have imagined a Western like McCabe before McCabe? Excuse me, you know I already got a whorehouse operating. Ah, oh, you can't call them crib cows, whores. I'm talking about a proper sporting house with class girls and clean linen and a proper hygiene. Well, I, I don't think you're going to find my clientele up here uh, too interested in that sort of thing. They will be once they get a taste of it. I'm telling you, with some up here to handle all them puntless properly, you can make yourself at least double the money you make on your own. Oh, now, what makes you think I ain't thought of that already? Uh, them tents, you know, it's just uh, temporary. What do you do when one girl fancies another? What How do you know when a girl really has a monthly or when she's just taking a few days off? What about when they don't get their monthlies? Because they don't. What do you do then? I suppose you know all about seeing that. And what about the customers? Who's going to skin them back and inspect them? You going to do that? I never tell stories. I don't, stories don't interest me. There's only about six stories and seven stories. And basically, I'm more interested in behavior. What it is, simply, is that I want to see something on screen that I've never seen before. There was a kind of industry cultural phenomena that precipitated a change in material choices. I, I do remember making deliverance with Borman and talking to the people about the thematic material about deliverance, you know, kind of homosexual rape and a deformed creature playing the banjo as the kind of cornerstone. And they thought that Borman and Voigt and all of us were insane. And, and yet it was a hit. I, having been a producer, uh, felt that the balance of power should shift to the director. I felt that... It was inherently a director's medium that the most exciting film work was being done by those filmmakers who had control, like Fellini, with whom I had made some films, with and Visconti, with whom I had made films. So I thought what I wanted to try to do at Warner's, if there was anything like a plan, was to make it clear to filmmakers themselves, the people that look through the cameras, that they were Trump, in my opinion. They didn't need uh, producers to... Uh, be parental toward them. Filmmakers and the studio heads were basically in sync. They were basically on the same page. The only conflicts that generally arose were over costs, uh, but not uh, uh, content. We had a relationship, Woody did, with, uh, with United Artists, with Arthur Krim. The way Arthur Krim ran his studio was you would go to lunch or you'd go to brunch at his house on Sunday. There'd be a little lox cream cheese he'd say he'd look into your eyes and he'd see how crazy you were if you didn't seem that crazy and it didn't seem that expensive he'd say go make your movie invite me to the opening Never said, I'm a filmmaker. He said, we're bankers. He said, we're not going to tell you how to make your movie. And it was this eccentric little thing that Woody wanted to do that had to do with uh, taking a more literary approach to cinema and having associations and tangents. We said, why not try and develop another structure, one where a word will lead to a memory, which will lead to a scene, and, then, and also load it up with all these... Uh, 
what they call in the theater the, the alienating devices like looking directly into camera, breaking the fourth wall, as it were, looking into lens and uh, cartoons and subtitles and all that sort of thing, remind the audience always that they're looking at a film. But it was sort of risky. And then one day he came in and said, you know, the thing that has a chance of really breaking through is the thing that's the riskiest that, that's ever been done. What do you mean our sexual problem? Uh, I, I mean, I'm comparatively normal for a guy raised in Brooklyn. Okay, I'm very sorry. My sexual problem. Okay, my sexual problem, huh? I, I, I never read that. That was, that was uh, Henry James, right? Novel? You know the what the sequel is? to Turn of the Screw? It's the my influence sexual... of television. Yeah, now, Marshall McLuhan deals with it in terms of it being a, a high... A high intensity, you understand? A hot medium. What I would give for a large sock as with horse manure in it. Clint, which he uses essentially what linear. do you do when you get stuck well, on a movie line with a guy like this behind you? Wait a minute, why can't just I give my maddening. opinion? This is a free country? He, he, he can give you. You have yeah. to give it so loud. I mean, aren't you ashamed to pontificate like that? And, and the funny part of it is, Marshall McLuhan, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's oh, really? work. really? Really? I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insights into Mr. McLuhan, well, have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so, yeah, just let me, let me, let me, come over here a second. Oh, tell I her. Heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Boy, if life were only like this. I had a very sort of privileged entrance into this whole thing. Um, through the association with Woody, he had done a lot of the groundwork and, and I, I kind of went to school with him. I, I kind of watched the way he navigated all of these problems with the studio and, 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 and content. And he always used to say, um, if you act like an artist, they'll treat you like an artist. you took a form that was clearly attractive to a mass audience and dealt with it seriously, then you had a chance for an extraordinary kind of critical mass occurring that could change the world. The studio really didn't have that much of an expectation of The Godfather because there had never been a successful movie about the Mafia. It's true, Paramount was in a very tough straits and I was only hired to do The Godfather because I was thought of as being, you know, young and corpsman trained, which is to say cheap. And I was Italian-American, which is to say I might, you know, be able to bring some authenticity to the Italian families. But the movie was budgeted at two and a quarter million dollars. And, and it was considered, a, you know, really, uh, you know, let's get a, like they say today, let's get some young film student in there and he'll do it do it cheap and in fact the godfather ended up costing about six and a half million dollars and i was in deep trouble i mean i was in very serious trouble uh, until the film turned out to be successful i have a belief with so-called work for hire is you fall in love with the movies you have to make you find what about that film that you love and so with the godfather i said well this is a classic story this is like shakespeare i'm going to do it like the story of a king and he has three sons and each son has gotten some part of his talent. One is cunning and cold, and one is violent and emotional, and the third is sweet but sort of dumb. And the godfather, the father, had all of those qualities. And that's why he was a great king. And, and I'm going to tell it sort of like a story of succession, and, and it's going to be very classical. And so out of whatever you've chosen to fall in love with comes the style. Send Fredo off to do this, send Fredo off to do that. Let Fredo take care of some Mickey Mouse nightclub somewhere. Send Fredo to pick somebody up at the airport. I'm your older brother, Mike, and I was stepped over. That's the way Pop wanted it. But it ain't the way I wanted it. I can handle things. I'm smart. Not like everybody says. Like dumb, I'm smart, and I want respect. When we did The Exorcist with Friedkin, we knew that it was a terrifying book, but you always kind of low-rated horror movies, scary movies, and we decided that we wanted to do it as wonderfully as possible. 
when I read it, I was like everyone else who read it, completely knocked out by it, but I didn't know that it was based on an actual case. When I signed on to do the film, I found that out, and I then decided to try to abandon all technique. I did not want the audience to be conscious of the camera at all. Owen Roisman lit it very dramatically, but very naturally. The Exorcist is made by a director who believes, and the writer, the screenwriter, and novelist who believe this is happening. We're not kidding, folks, was the attitude that we took. This is all weird stuff, strange behavior, but we believe it. All right, well, let's see what to do. Keep away! The sow is mine! I saw in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, it's called Empire of Light by Rene Magritte. It's a very simple, realistic landscape, except the top half of it is a sky in daylight, and the bottom half of it is a house at night, lit by a street lamp. And I had that in mind, I actually and chose the house to sort of match the Magritte painting. While I didn't make the sky a daylight sky, I did put up the street lamp, and I did have a shaft of light coming out the window. And the scene took a full day and night just to light, and then we shot it the next night. It became the ad because the original ad was a drawing of a little girl's hand holding a bloody crucifix. And the caption, for God's sake, help her. <laughs> and they showed me this ad, and I wanted to choke everyone in the room. I had to be physically restrained. And I said, you can't do, first of all, this is a cheap horror film piece of shit ad. And second, you don't use God's name in an ad, by the way. You don't use God to shill for your movie. The film business headline could read, The Devil Knocks Out the Mafia. For in 22 U.S. and Canadian cities, the old box office champ, The Godfather, is being flattened by that movie about diabolical possession, The Exorcist. It was uh, a traumatic experience. Oh, God, it just, it's so real, you know. I'm glad we saw it during the day. The theater owners tell us that uh, an average of three men, but only two women, faint at every evening performance. It had an enormous impact. And making popular entertainment seriously presented enough so that an adult audience could go and see it. I remember stories of Freddie Otash, the famous Hollywood private eye who would catch people in flagrante delicto, and that's how he made his living, and they were hilarious stories. And I thought, let's do a realistic private eye story with a real crime that's so much bigger than anything that he can imagine peeping into bedrooms and tie it to a violation of the father and his daughter and a violation by that man of the land and the future. That was Chinatown. A man called Anthony Silas, who was a vice cop in Los Angeles. I began asking him about his job, and he worked vice, and he worked it in Chinatown. And I said, uh, uh, what do you do down there? He says, nothing. I said, well, what do you mean, nothing? He says, well, you know, it's a place where you don't, uh, you can't understand the languages, you know, all the different, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, even if you could understand one, you can't understand them all. And you, it's almost impossible to tell whether you're uh, preventing a crime from being committed or you're aiding and abetting a crime. So, I mean, the best thing to do there is nothing. And so uh, I thought, well, that's an interesting <laughs> uh, uh, point of view for a cop. And, and I'm sure it's fairly realistic. And so Chinatown, from that moment on, became a word that meant the futility of good intentions. Okay, go home. But in case you're interested, your husband was murdered. Somebody has been dumping thousands of tons of water from the city's reservoirs, and we're supposed to be in the middle of a drought. He found out about it, and he was killed. There's a waterlogged drunk in the morgue, involuntary manslaughter if anybody wants to take the trouble, which they don't. It seems like half the city is trying to cover it all up, which is fine by me. But Mrs. Mulray, I goddamn near lost my nose, and I like it. I like breathing through it, and I still think that you're hiding something.
I liked genre at the time, and I thought I could be a genre director in Hollywood, but it, it wasn't working. I couldn't seem to work within the conventions of the genre. I felt I could express myself more in the terms of what I saw as European cinema, and yet I appreciated appreciated the personal cinema coming out of the Hollywood system, which is a very different kind of personal cinema than European. I sort of went, aimed myself more towards a European style in a way. It just became, um, uh, became I felt more comfortable there. But um, I'm not European. I'm American. I borrowed money all over this neighborhood, left and right, from everybody, and I never paid them back. So I can't borrow no money from nobody no more, right? So who does that leave me to borrow money from but you? I borrow money from you because you're the only jerk off around here that I can borrow money from without paying back, right? Right? Because, you know, that's what you are. That's what I think of you, a jerk off. <laughs> He's smiling like he's a jerk off. <laughs> You're a fucking jerk off. And I tell you something else, Mikey. I fuck you right where you breathe. Cause I don't give two shits about you or nobody else. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Fuck face. I always sort of fell back into a kind of personal. Uh, a personal kind of approach, which could be accused of maybe too much, per too personal. In other words, you know, basically, basically concentrating on yourself and not thinking about the audience. Or, I didn't think that though. The thing was that I, whatever I did, I couldn't help it. It came out that way. Mean Streets was being made. We saw early stuff. We're astonished by it. I mean, first of all, I thought that De Niro was a psychopath. That they had gotten out for the week and had hired. A whole different kind of a movie star emerged. The movie stars who almost looked like they could be your neighbor. Frank Stevie, Pearson the key. wrote this wonderful screenplay, and Al turned out to be heart-stoppingly exciting. You know, he just, it was a film that was made for him. I said to the cast, look, the only way I know of of avoiding any sensationalism and any sense of exploitation is if you make this so much your own that they see nothing but human beings up there. The humanity of it will stop any sense of outrageousness, because they're going to want to go. You know, on a on a Saturday night at the Lowy's Pitkin, some guy from the balcony is going to yell, you fucking fag, you know, and boom, and we're off. Or laugh at a place that's impossible, uh, that can destroy the movie. So the first thing I did, of course, was have the phones practical and have the two other actors off in another room so that they could talk to each other. I knew we'd get it in early takes or we weren't going to get it at all. We finished take one, and it was just magnificent. And I said to the guys, don't cut. And I just stood up over the black drape that we had put up there. And I said, Al, I want you to go again. And he was, it was spent. He was empty. And he looked at me. I thought he was going to hit me. 
And I said, go, now, action. And just res in automatic response. The reason for it was uh, uh, nothing that he really could have acted in the sense that he had, they had been there all day. It was now, what, 16 hours into this nightmare. And I wanted him to start the conversations where he had ended them up on take one, emotionally. Exhausted, spent, and now let's see what happens. I don't know, Leon. You know, I don't know what I'm I'm getting here with that shit. You know, what am I supposed to say to that shit? You know, I'm. This is going on, and you're giving me that shit. I'm so, I'm sorry. You know what's happening with me. You know that. You know the pressures I've been having, right? I mean, I got all these pressures, and you know about it. You're in that hospital there with all them tubes coming out. You want that fucking operation, right? You're giving me that shit. Everybody's giving me shit. Everybody needs money. You know what I mean? So. You needed money, I got your money. That's it. Yeah. Well, I didn't ask you to go and rob a bank. No, I know you didn't ask me. I know you didn't ask me. Look, I want to, you know, I'm not putting this on anybody. You know, nothing on nobody. I did this on my own. You see, all on my own I did it. But I just want you to know something. I want you to know that I'm going to, I'm getting out of here. I'm, t I'm getting a plane out of here. And I just wanted you to know it. That's all. And I wanted you to come down. And uh, I wanted to just say goodbye to you. You had a whole new group of both male and female people that came in that were not like the old-fashioned, if you will, movie stars of Hollywood. The non—they were—they were dark. They were imperfect. They weren't completely godlike. Jack and I always looked at the business kind of as a generational thing. So Brando, McQueen, Paul Newman, that group of guys was always ahead of us. We, we dismissed them. They were gone. I mean, they were movie stars while we were in high school, and yet they were young guys. So it wasn't about catching anybody. It was just being allowed to audition for the roles they got. Why should they have a corner on the market? We can act. Yeah, we don't look like they do. We're not handsome like they are, but we're fucking interesting. And we were interesting because we were honest. Oh, Christ, Jason, will you wake up for one minute? Will you open your eyes? Open your ears! Okay, okay, the big problem is where to dump me, isn't it? Well, isn't it? How's this? I'll shoot myself, huh? Then the three of you can run off to the South Sea Islands together. How's that? Well, how's this? You just stop acting crazy for a minute, huh? You want me to have to beg you? Is that it? Don't be rigid, Jason. That's a perfectly I good solution. I am not being rigid, sweetheart. I'm simply telling you, get your ass into the bedroom or I'll shoot you myself. Now, we both had a belly full of you. How's this? I'll shoot your brother David and then I'll go to the gas chamber and you can run off with Jessica, which is what you've been wanting to do for a long time. Just give me the gun. Isn't it, Jason? Just give me the gun. Isn't it, Jason? Well, let me tell you what's number one with me. You want to really know? It's my brother. Now, for 30 years, David and I have been trying to get together on something. We finally have an opportunity. We are very close. And if you think for one second that you're going to chase him back to Philly with all the scene you're putting on here and then it's going to be Jessica and you and me playing ukuleles forever in the sand, forget it! No, ma'am, never. So get a grip on yourself. What it seemed like to me was like boys had been let out of school. So it was like school's out. So the energy was unbelievably high. And that's what I think characterizes uh, North American filmmaking of the 70s is the energy. That um, inimical American male energy and uh it's it's fantastic but it wasn't a great time for women i'm a man eater a ball buster and castrator i want to get married all right where the fuck is my shoehorn this place is a mess there's not any food in the house half the time you look like you fell out of bed you spend more time in bed than any other human being past the age of six months than i ever heard of the reason I sleep all day is because I can't stand my life. What life? Sleeping all day. And just remember this. There is no better way for a man to start the day than with that bracing, glowing, ego-building feeling of knowing that he has just struck out in the sack. Struck out in the sack is, I assume, a mixed metaphor, undoubtedly American and probably nasty. It'll do. 
And may I point out, as you have so obviously never noticed, women are a little different from men. They require time, a little sensitivity. English women. Oh, women! Anybody but a superannuated Boy Scout would know that. What do you want? What do you want to do to me? <sighs> Calm down. I'm not afraid of you. How much do you want to let me go? My father is very rich. You could have the entire world at your fingertips. Listen, I have to be back by 11.30. I'm expecting a very important call. <sighs> speak, speak! Why don't you speak? What are you doing? Oh, oh you can't be serious. <sighs> I'm a... I... Oh, my God. Woof. <sighs> I'm, I'm, I'm engaged, and, and once he took, but, but I didn't, it was never a time, all the, uh, oh my, uh, uh. was making The Exorcist for Warner Brothers and John Kelly, who was head of Warner Brothers, sent me a message that they would like to do another film with me because he was looking at the dailies every day. So I said, wonderful, fine. And they started sending me all of the scripts that they had they thought I might be interested in. And all of the women's roles were within that, the convention at the time, which was, it was either a woman in jeopardy who was a victim or it was a dutiful wife, or a prostitute. You know, it was the, the, the whore, the mother, or the wife. Those were the, those were the roles. And um, I said I would like to do a film with them, but I didn't really like any of the ones that they offered me. And so I started looking for um, a film that reflected what I saw happening around me to myself and to all other women. And then I found Alice doesn't live here anymore. How do you know you can get a job? Because I will get one. Yeah, and what about when school starts? Don't worry about the mule going blind. Yeah, but what if it gets to be September? What if, and... what if, it, what if it gets to be what? What's your problem, kid? Huh? What do you want from me? What is it? What's bothering you? Here, get over here. Sit down there. This is what I want you to do, okay? I'll tell you, I want you to make me a list. I want to see it in writing. Let's have it. Okay, write it all out, all your problems, all the things that are wrong with your life, everything that can go bad. Come on, start writing. Write! Write it! A whole list, all the bad things. Well, why aren't you writing? Write! I'm out there spending too much money on clothes, trying to look like maybe I'm under 30 so that somebody will hire me, and you're sitting in here whining like an idiot. I will get a job, all right? I will get you to Monterey before your birthday. I will get you in school by September. I swear it. Shall I open a vein and sign it in blood? Marty Scorsese sets up the situation on the set where the most artistry can give birth to itself. And it's very improvisational, and everybody contributes what they have to. But it's my life, you know, my life. It's not some man's life that I'm going to help him out with. No man. Mm. I can't help it. That's the way I feel. Well, what is it you want? If I knew that, I wouldn't be out here crying in the toilet, would I? <laughs> <laughs> that was the feeling that I had, the realization that I had discovered for myself at that time in my own marriage, that I, I always thought I was a, an assistant person. <laughs> I was there to assist my husband in living the life, but it was his life that I was assisting with. And suddenly I realized, no, 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 wait a minute, this is my life, and I get to do what I want to do. And it was such a wild concept that I could do what I wanted to do. A friend of my wife's mind, a wonderful woman, came to show us her the deed to her house. She was divorced, and she had finally gotten her own home. And on the deed, it had her name, and it said an unmarried woman. 
and I had those light bulbs that go off in your head. And boom. So I started interviewing women who I kind of knew who were divorced and now considered unmarried. And out of that came this script, and I just I sort of became a woman for about three or four months. I was very comfortable. I want to know something. Did you fall out of love with my, my flesh, my body, or me? With Erica, did you fall out of love with Erica? Wait a minute, I didn't fall out of love with you. I, I love you. I mean, all right, it, it's different now, but I, I love you. I can't just erase all those years. I'll always love you. I was your hooker, Martin. I was a bright, high-priced, classy hooker. Upper East Side by way of Vassar hooker, but I was your hooker. You're the lousy shrink. There were glimmerings of emergent feminism. I think Jane Fonda saw to that. She never played a secondary role to the male leads. Every part she played was... It evolved from something less to something more. What's the difference between going out on a call as a model or as an actress or as a call girl? You're successful as a call girl. You're not because successful. Because when you're a call girl, you control it. That's why. Because someone wants you. Not me. I mean, there are some Johns that I have regularly that want me, and that's terrific. But they want a woman, and I know I'm good, and I arrive at their hotel or their apartment, and they're usually nervous, which is fine, because I'm not. I know what I'm doing. And for an hour, for an hour, I'm the best actress in the world and the best fuck in the world, and... Why do you say you're the best actress in the world at that oh, time? Oh, because it's an act. I have a special debt that I feel I owe Jane, in a way, because They Should Horses Don't They was a kind of a turning point in my career. It was one of the great movie experiences I have ever had, despite the fact that it was a kind of a director's nightmare in the sense that it's all in one set. Number two, it's all the same activity. And number three, it's all the same activity in one set that has to get slower because they get more tired. I had to design the lighting and the sets so that there were no floor units, no walls, and everything could go 360 degrees. And going 360 degrees meant I couldn't give her any days off. She was very serious about her work. I mean, terrifically serious. And she did this performance without a shred of vanity. Jane was way out in front of everybody, and it took a lot of guts to be that visible and that open and frank. She was sort of fearless in a way. Whether you agreed with her or you didn't agree with her, you certainly had to admire her guts and her passion and her conviction. She was not playing it safe. Because although the bombs are falling on Vietnam, it's in an American tragedy. The tragedy is ours, and it's going to take the American people many, many years to undo the damage and to wipe off the blight that has been put on our flag and our country by the likes of Mr. Nixon. I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. There was a moment with uh, all the president's men. Bob Redford came up one day and said he'd gotten the galleys to this book by Woodward and Bernstein, and would I take a look at it? But I read it and was inflamed. I mean, I thought, my God, we have to do this. Anything we can do to move Nixon out of there must be done. Half the country never even heard of the word Watergate. Nobody gives a shit. You guys are probably pretty tired, right? Well, you should be. Go on home. Get a nice hot bath. Rest up 15 minutes and get your asses back in gear. We're under a lot of pressure, you know, and you put us there. Nothing's riding on this except the uh, First Amendment of the Constitution, freedom of the press, and maybe the future of the country. 
Not that any of that matters. But if you guys fuck up again, I'm going to get mad. To be able to make a movie that could assault a shocking social condition and be effective with it. Everybody felt that anything was possible, and it turned out almost to be the case. What happened in the late 60s and early 70s shattered that trust between the people and the government, possibly irrevocably. They were lying to us. You couldn't trust them. You can't trust authority. You don't, can't trust the cops. You can't trust the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. And it was all this, these guys have betrayed us, these guys have betrayed us, these guys have betrayed us. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. But I am somebody. I am black. Beautiful! Shoot all the niggas. Why? Because <laughs> why should they come over here and wreck the city? I think the American dream is in the past. It's long gone. Because if you don't flaunt it, who's going to know you're homosexual or, or not? What they wanted to do was to flaunt it. We're praying for him to be delivered from his demon lifestyle, Father. Watergate was the high point of the 70s, and I think the lead up to what finally happened, and then what happened itself, which disillusioned a great portion of the country in the 1970s, uh, also affected filmmakers, because probably, if you were looking for the single um, defining phrase that motivated the filmmakers at that time, it would probably be moral ambiguity. I think I can get you whatever you'd like. Do mm -hmm. whatever I'd like. Whatever you'd like. And most of all, I'd like to suck his cock. <laughs> Ashby, Town, and Beatty showed a utterly immoral, grotesquely greedy, decadent society that they felt was imminent. Looking at it, you thought it's all about sex. The lack of value, the lack of morals is all to do, and the, the immorality is sexual immorality. But in fact, when you look at it again, because it, it, it's, it's, it's a very dense movie, it much more, it's actually more dense, more full of particles than, than a lot of Howell's work. Um, and when you look at it again, you see that there's all sorts of areas of, of, of valuelessness that are political, economic, all sorts of ways that we can see now have... Um, become just a way of life. How long you had this? About six weeks. Well, I won't be going tonight either. Oh, honey, please don't... Does he know we went together? Well, no, it never came up. Well, what tell him we went together, then I'll take it. There's not one girl who comes into that shop you wouldn't do this for, is I'm there? not going to be a beard for you and this guy. <laughs> Why, is it against your principles? Yeah. <laughs> like to know what you've been doing with his wife to get the money for the oh, shop. Oh, yeah, I don't fuck anybody for money. I do it for fun. I'll do whatever you want me to, you know that. Sometimes, George. <laughs> want me to do your hair? All the hypocrisies, great and small, election night dinners, those that take place in beauty salons, those that do not take place everywhere. It was a way of sort of bringing them all together. On the East Coast, you could call it six degrees of separation. Out here, it was just shampoo. Even though the characters were flawed, or perhaps especially because they were flawed, audiences could identify with him because in the first place uh, their, uh, theirs were flaws that either arose from or were victimized by what they perceived to be a very flawed 
uh, system. Oh, come on, you're not gonna say that now. You're not gonna say that now. You're gonna pull that hen house shit now. When the vote the chief just voted, it was ten to nine. Now I want that television set turned on right now. At the beginning, I thought that Nurse Ratchet really should personify the powerful, bad mama. And suddenly it occurred to me the real dangerous evil is always trying to look like an angel. They are all, everything is done in the name of helping you. I'm going, we are going to help you live better. Because as individuals, you know, we need institutions. We create them to help us live. We even pay them to help, help us live. And then very often we end up being dictated by these institutions, dominated by these institutions. Oh, Billy. Will you guys clear the door? Everybody out. 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 Everybody out. Come on, God damn it. Now calm down. The best thing we can do is go on with our daily routine. All right? Max, you're Don't. People were asking me very often, you know, Jesus, this is a wonderful group. It's such a piece of Americana. How could you do that? You know, you coming from Central Europe. And I didn't understand that. So listen, I lived, I lived in that society. Communist Party was our big nurse, you know. And all we were dreaming about is to grab that big thing and throw it through the barbed wire and go out to see the free world. When times are bad, when people are frightened, when they're insecure, when they don't know what in the world is going on, they turned to artists and they said, build us a shelter, anything, a lean-to, a little cabin, an igloo. Build us a, a protective shell so we can understand where we are. I don't care if it's a scary shell, just so it's a shell. Loneliness has followed me my whole life, everywhere, in bars and cars. Sidewalks, stores, everywhere. There's no escape. I'm God's lonely man. June 8th. My life has taken another turn again. The days move along with regularity, over and over. One day indistinguishable from the next. A long, continuous chain. Then suddenly, there is a change. I didn't have a job, I was in debt, my marriage broke up, I lost the new girlfriend, everything collapsed. Then I wrote that script out of that emptiness. I sat down, I wrote two drafts in ten days, got in the car and left. I, I, it had to come out of me, it just had to come out of me. It was just, you know, like an animal inside my chest. All I can say is identified with the Travis Bickle character, of being the outsider, sort of the dispossessed, and seeing the danger, of course, of... Travis's character, where he feels one way and then fantasizes, but then acts out the fantasy in violence, which is obviously wrong. I felt totally understood him and totally felt the same way. You know, Iris. No, you know, I don't Iris. know nobody named Iris. Iris, come on, get out of here, man. You don't know anybody by the name of Iris? I don't know nobody named Iris. No? Hey, get back to your fucking tribe before you get hurt, huh, man? Do me a favor. I don't want no trouble, huh? Okay? Got a gun? Get the fuck out of here, man. Get out of here. Suck on this. Oh, 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 oh. Nobody really thought it was going to make money, but it was kind of in the spirit of the time to do an adventurous film like this with all these young buds. The establishment, as it was called so frequently, uh, 
what it said about itself and about the country was wildly at odds with what was emerging, I think gave rise to a ton of movies that dealt with the disparity between a convention, a conventional view of the country, and what the filmmakers felt the country was about. We didn't have quick responses to Vietnam. They didn't rush out and make a bunch of movies about Vietnam. It's not what happened. Everybody was trying to understand it. We never meant to make anything but a movie about the war at home. My character was in the way in that movie of the conventional Hollywood love story. Hal. He had to have that character because I'm the movie. They're the love story. They're the popular movie. But I'm the ode to Vietnam because I'm the cripple one. I'm not going to make excuses for what happened. It happened. I needed somebody. I was lonely. Bullshit it's not. Me. Don't. Bob, I was lonely. Me. Don't bullshit. I need. Me. It's not bullshit. Bullshit! No, Bob, please. God damn it, it's bullshit. Everybody needs somebody, for Christ's sake. If it's over with us, it's over. Well, what are you saying? That you're not even going to make the effort? What I'm saying is. I do not belong in this house! Please. And they're saying that I don't belong over there! Hal Ashby, he was watching everything. He would never interfere, but he would just set it up. The speech at the high school was an improvised scene. And we got this scene, and I said, Hal, you know, I really, I, I got to be able to say something, something to kids. He says, you got it. And now I'm here to tell you that I have killed for my country or whatever. And I don't feel good about it. Because there's not enough reason, man. To feel a person die in your hands or to see your best buddy get blown away. I'm here to tell you, it's a lousy thing, man. I don't see any reason for it. And there's a lot of shit that I did over there that I find fucking hard to live with. And I don't want to see people like you, man, coming back and having to face the rest of your lives with that kind of shit. It's simple as that. I don't feel sorry for myself. I'm a lot fucking smarter now than when I went. I'm just telling you, there's a choice to be made here. For him to say, you know, I'm not telling you, don't go. For a real advocate to say that, directed by a real advocate, non-war, non-violence, for him to say, I'm not saying don't go. I'm just saying there's a choice to be made here, and it's yours. The American people are turning sullen. They've been clobbered on all sides by Vietnam, Watergate, the inflation, the depression. They turned off, shot up, and they fuck themselves limp, and nothing helps. So, this concept analysis report concludes the American people want somebody to articulate their rage for them. I've been telling you people since I took this job six months ago that I want angry shows. I don't want conventional programming on this network. I want counterculture. I want anti-establishment. Network written by Paddy Chayefsky was so bold and so accusatory and so revelatory about the media, exposing to, I think, an audience that actually didn't understand that their media was totally corporatized and that they, the corporations, chose what to give them. And we better start putting together one winner for next September. I want a show developed based on the activities of a terrorist group. Paddy Chayefsky is the most prescient. I mean, you remember in Network we had a character called Sybil the Soothsayer? That's Paddy. Gross proceeds should consist of all funds the sublicensee receives, not merely the net amount remitted after payment to the sublicensee or distributor. We're not sitting still for overhead charges as a cost prior to distribution. Dog, fuck with my distribution costs! I'm making a lousy 215 per segment. I'm already deficiting 25 grand a week with Metro. I'm paying William Morris 10% off the top. 
And I'm giving this turkey 10th hour for segment number five for this fruitcake. And Helen, don't start no shit with me about a piece again. I'm paying Metro 20% for all foreign and Canadian distribution. And that's after recruitment. The Communist Party's not going to see a nickel out of this goddamn show until we go into syndication. Oh, come on, Lorraine. The party's in for 7500 a week production expense. I'm not giving this pseudo-insurrectionary sectarian a piece of my show. I'm not giving him script approval. And I sure as shit ain't cutting him into my distribution charges. You fucking fascist! Did you see the film we made of the San Marino jailbreak out demonstrating the rising up of the seminal prisoner class infrastructure? You can blow the seminal prisoner class infrastructure out your ass! I'm not knocking down my goddamn distribution charges! Man, give her the fucking overhead claws. Tell me something good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tell me that you love me. Yeah. Tell me something good. Oh, baby, 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 yeah. Tell me that you like it. Yeah. speak for myself but i think it's about time we had a good fantasy movie i mean we just had so many kind of burned out on all the social commentary movies we've had there was a shift in the country it was post vietnam its sense of impotence in the wake of vietnam and watergate people just wanted to feel that they had some control over their lives you know uh and uh or they wanted to see somebody who had it suddenly there it was do we get to win now when Rocky came my way, there was a great depression in the land and frustration with Vietnam. Everybody needed an injection of uh, hope and uh, optimism. People really got into that fight somehow or other. I mean, I saw people get up in an audience, you know, theater. They just go, Rocky, go. You know, nobody even knows who won the fight. <laughs> Jaws was a, 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 just a good adventure movie. The fact that it turned out to be, you know, the biggest money maker of its time. I don't think anyone knew that the fear of water was as strong as it was. And it just, the movie just rocketed around the world. You could have played it in Delhi with, 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 without dialogue and people would get it. And they were scared to death because it was a very expensive movie at the time. But once they started to show it, they were going to mass market this movie like crazy. And they did. Jaws was the first time an A-budget picture, based on a bestseller even, opened in, you know, a thousand theaters and went through the roof. It was the first time the studio said, wait a minute, why should we take a full-page ad out for one theater when we can take a full-page ad out for a hundred theaters? It was the beginning of, Jesus Christ, we can recover a hundred million dollars in six or seven weeks. It was the beginning of getting elements and a window of time and a release date so that the parts became bigger than the whole. And that's when there was this sort of feeding frenzy, speaking of Jaws, to buy studios and say, hey, wait a second, these guys, this is not just a tiny little industry. This, is, this has got big possibilities for big bucks later on. Slow ahead. I can go slow ahead. Come on down and chump some of this shit. We're gonna need a bigger boat. We've never really gotten around Jaws. Trub was a very talented filmmaker, made a very good movie. And I won't say that the wrong lessons were learned, but the lessons were followed to a fault. Star Wars is now part of our history. But money alone can't define its impact, particularly not for the hardcore Star Wars fans. Star Wars cost $9 million to produce. It will bring in at least 10 times that amount. As a result, the price of 20th Century Fox stock has doubled in the last two weeks. The film is breaking attendance records all over the country. Not since Jaws have so many people stood in line to see a movie. An entirely different audience was brought into the cinema. People came out of 
the walls and the woodwork and other places that we're not going to films in those kind of numbers with the advent of Star Wars, which was 1977. People began to go to films five, six times. It was almost a religious experience. Star Wars, what did you think? I thought it was great, really outrageous. Special effects were super. They were good. Yeah. It's the best movie I've seen for a long time. It was the most enjoyable experience I've had since I was a child. It was fantastic. It was entertaining, and at the same time, it was something you could cheer with. It was good against evil. Do you think it was escapist-type entertainment? Sure, I love it. That's my favorite kind of entertainment. Bread and circuses, you know. So, I mean, people do look for escape. I mean, my mother, you couldn't drag my mother to see a sad movie, you know. She, she'd say, I'm not going to see that. Uh, she said, I got enough problems. Feelers are being sent out and pa new patterns are being tried and people are realizing that, you know, you can open a film in all these theaters and you can make more money on the album, Saturday Night Fever, than you did on the film. And you can make more money on the merchandising, Star Wars, than you did on the film. The feeling among the major studios in Hollywood, we've got to do more of this, and we've got to do them bigger and better. There's only one Spielberg, you know, only one Lucas. Um, uh, and uh, I, think, I think what happened there is that they all ran to that group. <laughs> it's not the filmmaker's fault. It's, it's, uh, it's those who uh, wanted to cash in on that and, and use that as a gauging of what a success should be in Hollywood. No risk. There can't be art without risk. It's like saying, you know, it's like, it's like saying, you know, there's no sex and then expect there to be children. And the directors that were our new crop were all buying their Rolls Royces and they're having their limousines and being driven to the airport and, you know, having the company plane, you know, they were, they were all living the high life. So I think they, you know, they were beginning to lose touch with the American people. I really, I believe that deeply. The sense began to creep in that Hollywood in particular was uh, a place of wretched excess. I mean, we all made a picture or two that were more expensive than they should have been, and they didn't work. And then people said, well, maybe they don't know. It was a big to-do about how the film director had too much freedom, had too much money, had too much power. And, uh, and, and a group was going to, you know, come there and put the film director in its place. They very quickly learned that the way not to be at the mercy of filmmakers is to do your own demographics and your own studies and to figure out what the audience wants. And the best way they could come up with no risk was to make a movie in exactly the mold of the last one that had been successful with exactly the stars. And you could no longer go in there and say, this is what you want, this is what you should be doing. They would say, no, no, we know what we should be doing. We know what we want. Now, how can you do this for us? They're in the hands of these guys that run these corporations. They're, you know, they, they don't care whether it's a movie or a, a, a ski. But as I say, it's a business and you have to make money. Forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown. If there's a couple of things I can say most about the 70s, what have we left the industry with? A lot of movies nobody's seen or really caught up with. But they make a statement, not just about that decade, but about those of us that are still marching, incidentally, uh, and have now left a history, but are still making history. If you look at the titles of the just the Academy Award nominees, let's say. It's a blend of films, the likes of which we've never seen in this country, never. Everybody started taking off in these different directions and doing these wildly disparate movies that were personally driven, in a way, and not in any way factory, you know, not product. They were the opposite of product. I think the independent film world is where, is it, where it's at now absolutely where it's at. You're getting wonderful, wonderful films out of it. And of course, you're getting some that aren't so wonderful. But it's, it's original. That's the, that's the thing. And that's what those 70s films were. They were original. Original means you've never seen it before. I think there's some great big Hollywood movies that are just terrific. But there's a lot of them that are real crap, too. There's a lot of independent films that are really crap. 
It's, it's just being able to have an intelligent uh, distributor be able to c cipher through and, and, and also be able to give people an opportunity to see what they want to see. I think it's wonderful that someone can make an ingenious, entertaining film that can make $100 million in a day. I, I, I bless them and admire them, but for that to be the entire cinema is like the entire pharmaceutical business being devoted only to tranquilizers and, and Viagra. There has to be the personal statement. Um, otherwise, the, the culture is going unrepresented on a deep level. I'm going to do, uh, I'm hoping to do, uh, a Crouching Jew, Hidden Tiger, about a Jewish guy who starts to learn how to fly, a rabbi. But I don't know if I can get the money. Every once in a while, there's this moment of like childish glee, and we say, oh, it's so great, like, you can do this, and my God, film is so amazing. You take this piece and take that piece and put them together, and they turn into something else. That amazement is, is true. I mean, the, the cinema is like that. It is magic, and, and I think to always be capable of being an amateur, of being a beginner, means that you're always doing it for love and pleasure. That's the thrill of filmmaking to me, the thrill of failure, potential failure. This may not work. Yeah, but if it does work, it's going to be terrific. I'm always looking for younger people to do something completely new, to push cinema to its limits, to uh, uh, outside its limits, really. I remember when Akira Kurosawa got his Academy Award for his lifetime achievement. He said uh, he was about 82 years old, and he said uh, he's just beginning to, to realize the possibilities of film. That's why it's so important to me that I do nothing else but crack through the original I'm working because I haven't done one since the conversation and quite frankly I don't know that I'm capable of it. So since I don't know that I'm capable of it all the more I want to just say well I'm going to just keep trying until, until I do it or die. The last thing I just want to say is I want to send my, my, my wishes and my thoughts to Ted Demi, who I know was involved in this film, who was a very, very sweet person. Most important of all was a wonderful filmmaker and a young father who unfortunately left a very young family who loved him dearly and uh, a wonderful person full of fun and interesting uh, ideas. Uh, but I will see him playing with his kids.